Welcome, everyone. We're gathering today in a manner that's certainly unusual for worship at Silver Creek Fellowship. But our aim today is for you to engage in all of the important parts of a Christian worship service. With worship and prayer, Bible teaching, giving offerings, As this online service goes along, I want you to participate in several different ways. You can share comments at any time by using the chat feature. Actually, go ahead and try it right now. And if you have a prayer request, click the live prayer button and someone from our team will pray for you and with you. You can fill out a connection card and let us know who's here. On that connection card, you can check one of the boxes to request ministry Give us your prayer requests and praise reports. And then one important element in any kind of worship service is your giving. Your financial gifts support the work that God's doing at Silver Creek Fellowship, and it makes it possible for us to do the vital ministries that we do every day of the year. Please take a moment to prayerfully consider making a gift to support the ministry here at Silver Creek Fellowship. You can easily do this by just clicking the Give button on your screen. Or you can visit our website at scf.tv slash giving or text give to the telephone number 503-966-2424. Or you can do it the old-fashioned way and just mail a check to our office at Post Office Box 8 in Silverton. I want to thank you for participating with us today in this worship service. I know times are changing and everything is rapidly happening and no one knows for sure what's going to happen. But no matter what happens, we know that God is in control. We know that God has promised to never leave us or forsake us. We know that God has a plan for our good for each and every one of us. And another thing we know, every need in this world that's happening right now is an open door to share God's love. And that's why we as a church family, as the body of Christ in our community, that's why we are responding to this coronavirus, not by panicking and not by fear, but by serving the people who are around us. No matter how frustrating or confusing or scary this this crisis gets, fear doesn't have the final say. God tells us in 1 John 4, 28, there is no fear in love, but that perfect love casts out all fear. Our hope is built on the perfect love of Jesus Christ, so we've been called to share that love in the world, and that's exactly what we're going to be doing in these coming weeks and months. And the more and more our community Um, is in panic, the more we will share the love of God. Let's make ourselves available to him. So here we are, Lord. Here we are. We're your people. We've come to praise you today, and we will join in with people all over this globe that are saying, you are God. Oh, never gonna stop. 
never gonna stop singing. Oh, every tribe, every tongue, every tribe, every tongue, every heart will sing. We thank you and we worship you because you are great and you are greatly to be praised. No matter what our situation, no matter what our circumstance, we look to you, Jesus, and we believe that you will do great things.
Hi, I'm Kurt Barnes, one of our pastors at Silver Creek Fellowship, and today I'm going to be sharing with you out of the book of John, my favorite of all the Gospels. We're going to be looking today from John chapter 11. So if you've got a Bible with you, why don't you open up in your Bibles, or if you're watching on the live stream right now, you can click the Bible tab and actually look up John chapter 11, and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, the NLT today, so you could pull down that tab and select that option. Now, the series that we are beginning today is called The Road to the Cross. We're going to be looking at Jesus' final days of his earthly ministry. We're going to look at those last people and places that Jesus had contact with that ended up leading him to the cross. So I want to catch you up on the narrative of where we're at in today's story. At this point, Jesus has spent the last three years of his life ministering all around the Judean countryside. He has healed the sick. He has proclaimed the gospel to the poor. He has done amazing things, taught to the crowds, the masses. But recently, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Feast of Dedication, you could read this story in John chapter 10. While he was there, Jesus gives the most clear answers of exactly who he is, where he came from, how long he was there, that is uh, recorded, in my opinion, in all of Scripture. The Pharisees ask him direct questions, who he is, where he came from, and Jesus answers them directly. Now, that leads to the religious leaders being furious with Jesus, to the point where they picked up stones and tried to kill him. But because it was Jesus was not yet Jesus's time, they were unsuccessful, and Jesus left safely. So now Jesus and his disciples, they've left Jerusalem and gone out into the countryside and continued on with Jesus's ministry when they get word that a very close friend of Jesus, a, a family that has been friends with Jesus through this entire ministry, Lazarus and his sister Mary and Martha, they hold a special place in Jesus' heart. In fact, Lazarus is known as the one Jesus loved. So Jesus gets word that Lazarus has become sick, bad sick. Mary and Martha send a runner to Jesus, who's apparently fairly close by to Bethany. They send a runner to Jesus and they say, the runner says, hey, Lazarus is sick. Can you come, Jesus, and help us? When Jesus hears the message that Lazarus, his friend that he loves, is sick, this is what he says. This is not a sickness that will lead to death, but rather is the sickness that will glorify my father. So Jesus hears that his friend Lazarus is sick, and then he continues, stays where he's at, for a couple more days and continues to minister. He doesn't get up and immediately go to Bethany where Lazarus is dying. Then we read in the text, Lazarus dies. And then Jesus says, okay, now let's go to Bethany. His disciples say, no, wait a minute, Jesus. Why would we go back to Bethany? Remember, they just tried to kill you there because Bethany is only a couple miles outside of Jerusalem. And Jesus says, yep, we're going back to Bethany and we're going to wake up Lazarus who's fallen asleep. Now, this should encourage you. The disciples are a lot like us. They don't always get things right away. They say, well, Jesus, wait, if Lazarus is asleep, shouldn't we let him sleep? Because if you're sick and you sleep, then you'll get better. And Jesus says to them, no, 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 he's not asleep. He's dead. So we're going to go so that you might see the glory of God. And the disciples are like, all right, we'll go with you. I guess we can die as you die. And they follow Jesus thinking they're heading into Jesus's uh, certain death. And from there, we'll actually read from the text, starting in John chapter 11, verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, so many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. I want you to notice what Martha just did. 
she immediately brings up the past. It's the first thing out of her mouth, and it's a legitimate concern. If you'd have been here, Jesus, then my brother wouldn't have died. This is the first thing she says. Now, it's easy for you and I to read the Bible backwards. What I mean by that is it's easy for us, if you know the Bible and you know the story of Lazarus, to remember what happens in the end. And so we read these type of conversations with Jesus and Martha, and we don't read exactly what was happening in the moment. Now, let me explain what I mean. You don't have to be an expert in first century history or anything like that, especially to know how difficult this moment would have been for this family. Put yourself in the story. Imagine this with me. You're one of the two sisters, and you've been trying to nurse your dying brother back to health while waiting on his close friend Jesus to show up. Only, Jesus never did show up. There was no ICU. There was no electricity. There was no modern medicine. There was no PPE. There was no ventilators. There was nothing to help them. They were helpless, trying everything they knew how to do to keep their brother alive. I don't know if you have been around sickness before, but if you turn on the news right now, look out your front door, you know that sickness is a serious thing. And being around sickness and being around death is always hard. And Mary and Martha had just watched up close their brother die. They were waiting. They were hoping that Jesus would show up, that he would get there. And Jesus doesn't come. And their brother dies. So Martha immediately says, Jesus, if you would have just been there, my brother would have lived. Now, I want to tell you, there's nothing wrong with looking at the past. In fact, repeatedly throughout Scripture, we are commanded to remember what God has done for us, to remember God's faithfulness, to remember times where God has been good to us and gracious, even to remember the valleys that we've been through in which God led us through so that we can remember his provision in times of difficulty. But see, this thing about our past can become a sticking point, a hang-up for a lot of us, because it becomes difficult for you to believe the truth about who God is, and who Jesus is because of what you experienced in your past. You've got some really difficult questions, and I never want to shy away from those difficult questions. Questions like, how can God love me and still have allowed me to experience what I experienced in my past? How could God love us and still have this virus raging in our community? And for many, there are things in your past that have actually now defined your whole life. It's become an identity for you. And you can't reconcile that God is loving because of what you experienced in the past. Listen, if there's any kind of abuse in your background, or any kind of neglect in your background, or any kind of darkness in your background, you are probably asking questions like this one. Where were you, God? If you're good, where were you? This is the question that Martha asks. Where were you? If you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Now, we miss this often when we read this story. We miss this tension because if you're a church person like me, you know the end of the story. You know what's about to happen. But in the moment when this was taking place, Martha had no clue about what Jesus was about to do. The people there were crying real tears. They were upset. They were mourning. Mary, Martha's sister, who loved Jesus, who loved Jesus, had decided not even to come out of the house to greet Jesus. Then Jesus says this, verse 23, your brother will rise. See, Let's look at how Martha responds to that statement. Martha's response is to look into the future. Look at her response with me in verse 24. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. 
See, here we have Martha looking back to the past first. If you'd only been here, Jesus, and then looking to where her hope is in the future. You know, I, yes, I know Jesus. In the last day, he'll rise again because that's where her hope lies, in the future. And Jesus steps in in this moment and says this, no, 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 no. Verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? See, this statement is a problem for those of us that want to believe that Jesus was just a good teacher. Because see, Jesus makes lots of statements like this one. He says, I, and only I, am the solution. Right here, right now, today, he says, no, 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 Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrection and the life isn't some future event. It's here, it's now, it's available to you all today. Jesus is saying, I am the solution. I am the solution to your problems. I am the solution to your hurts from your past. I am your future hope. He says, I am the resurrection. All who believe in me will not die. They will not have an eternal death. Even though they die in the flesh, they'll still live. And then he goes on to say this wonderful thing. Not only am I the resurrection, but I'm also the life. And then Jesus invites us to follow him. He's inviting us into his life. It's a life only experienced for those of us in Christ Jesus. I am the life. Jesus is making this declaration that his life is available to you now. I'm standing right here. I'm, I'm in the present. I'm here now. And then Jesus asks her the most important question. It's a question that is still ringing through all of eternity. And it's the question that is facing you and I right now today. Jesus said, do you believe this? It's the question in front of each and every one of us today. Do we believe Jesus Christ is who he said he was? And so Martha answers, starting in verse 27. Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is come into this world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. Sound familiar? It's the exact same words spoken by Martha, and I'm sure those words had been repeated over and over and over so many times in the last four days that it is the first thing out of both of their mouths and the thing on everyone else's theirs mind. Maybe this is where you are at today. Maybe you've been asking God, where are you? Why aren't you helping us? If you would just have shown up, if you would just show up, this would all go away. I know that this is the number one thing that I hear when I speak to non-believers. They refuse to believe in God and accept that Jesus was his son because they see all this death and sickness and pain and chaos. And they think, no, 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 there's no way an all-powerful God is out there or else he'd put a stop to this. So let's see how Jesus responded to this question. How did Jesus defend himself? Let's look, verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. 
Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Now, I think that this text contains an incredibly important lesson for you and I right now in the midst of our current circumstances. Let me explain. Jesus knew exactly what he was about to do. He knew exactly who he was. He knew exactly what power he had. And he told his disciples before they ever got up and made the trip to Bethany exactly what they were going to do when they got there. He said, we're going to wake Lazarus up. Jesus already knew the outcome. And yet still, when Jesus saw in the moment people he loved in real time, facing the difficulty of sickness and death and hurt and sadness, it moved Jesus to tears, and he wept with the people. Now, this has always seemed odd to me. Jesus knows he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead, and instead of saying, hey, everybody, stop your crying, cheer up, don't fuss, don't be sad because I'm going to fix everything right now. I'm in control. You don't have to cry. Stop your tears. Everyone have faith. I'm here. That's not what he said. That's not what he did. He saw the effects of sickness and death and sin on the lives of people, and it moved him deeply. And he wept with them in real time. In the moment, Jesus wept with the people. And when people saw Jesus weeping, it reminded them how much Jesus loved Lazarus, how much Jesus cared for his friends. Now, sometimes we Christians... Because we have faith that God is working all things together for the good for those who are in Christ Jesus and called according to his purposes, because we know God is good, because we know God is sovereign, because we know God is just, because of our faith that God has the outcome in his hands, which is all absolutely true. But sometimes we have the tendency to poo-poo other people's hurts and pain in real time. But this is not what Jesus did. Jesus wept. Even if the tears the people were shedding would soon become irrelevant because Jesus knew the outcome, he still wept. So let's look again, starting in verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord said Martha, the sister of the dead man. By this time, there's a bad odor, for he's been in there for four days. She says, Jesus, we cannot open the tomb for you. That's a ridiculous request. Our brother's been dead for four days, and it will stink if we open it. Jesus says to her, verse 40, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? See, what does it take to see the glory of God? Well, Jesus said it takes our belief. Now, I love to highlight this whenever I teach from this text. I love how tender Jesus is towards doubt. See, what does he say? Does he rebuke Martha? Does he go, you know what? I was about to do something really special here and you ruined it. You know what? You just got done saying you believe I'm the Messiah, the Son of God. Why don't you just listen to me and open up the tomb? That's not what Jesus does. This is a significant moment, and Jesus says to her, No, no, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So let's keep reading, verse 41. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I say this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. 
the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Let's go back again for a second. I I just want to go back again before we focus on the ending and remember what led up to this moment, what the last week would have been like for the people in the story. Mary and Martha, the two sisters, watched their brother struggle to his last breath. They watched their once vibrant brother slip away and die. They saw this up close, all while looking out the window and thinking, when will Jesus come? Where's Jesus? They say to the runner, did you tell him? Did you tell him that Lazarus was sick? And he says, yeah, I told him. And Jesus said the sickness wouldn't lead to death. They said, well, then what did he do? He just stayed there and kept teaching. I have to imagine that there were many in the house as Lazarus struggled for his last breath that were thinking, when is Jesus going to come? So let me ask you, What do you think happened the moment that Lazarus walked out of that grave? The moment Lazarus stood up and walked out of that grave, what happened to all that sadness? What happened to all the heartbreak? What happened when Lazarus came out of the tomb? All of that sadness, all of that hurt, all of that heartbreak, it disappeared the moment that Lazarus stepped out. All the sorrow, all the loss, All the heartbrokenness, all the doubt, all the fear, all of the accusations against Jesus, whether or not he actually cared for them, whether or not he actually loved them. In the moment he stepped out, it was all gone. Lazarus comes out still wrapped up like a mummy in his grave clothes. He steps out of the tomb. He's now alive, resurrected from the dead. Now, let me ask you, where had Mary and Martha put their hope? Their hope had been in the future, the future resurrection, the one that would take place on the last day. But Jesus brought the hope of their future right into the present, right into the now, in the present. Mary and Martha, their hope came. It arrived. It was a person. His name was Jesus, the resurrection and the life available now. Today, he was present. See, what Jesus told Martha is, no, no, no. I am the resurrection. I'm the way. I'm the life. Believe in me now. Put your faith in me now. If you do, you'll never die. Believe in me now and you'll live. This offer from Jesus is on the table for you today, for me today. That if you believe in Jesus Christ, then his resurrection power and his life is available to you now. That's how simple it is. I know that many of you right now are thinking about your mortality and your future may be more than you ever have, and rightfully so. But today, I want to draw your thinking out of the future and back to this present moment. Jesus' offer to you today is not just that someday you'll have a new life. His offer to you today is that if you place your faith in him and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Messiah, who died for your sins and rose again from the dead, if today you put your faith in that, then Jesus says, my resurrection and my life are available to you and to your circumstance and to your situation now, today. But see, this new life that Jesus offers us didn't come cheap. It came at a great price. See, This miracle that Jesus just performed, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, was so big, was so dramatic, was so public, and was so close to the city of Jerusalem that this miracle would ultimately lead to Jesus' arrest warrant and Jesus' death. The Sanhedrin, the, the highest court of the land, hears about this and gathers together. In verse 48, this is what they say. 
If we allow Jesus to go on like this, if we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will believe in him. Then the Roman army will come and destroy both our temple and our nation. If we let Jesus keep doing stuff like this, everyone is going to believe in him. And if everyone believes in him, then our way of life will come to an end because the Romans will come and destroy our temple. Now, let me tell you, this wasn't crazy thinking on their part because less than 40 years from this day, that's actually what happened. But verse 49, Caiaphas, who was the high priest at that time, said, you guys don't know what you're talking about. You don't realize that it is better for you, that one man should die for the people than for the whole nation to be destroyed. He says it would be better if we just killed Jesus so that the rest of the nation could be saved. Little did they know the words that they were speaking and the power of what was about to come. You see, because Jesus did exactly that. He willingly sacrificed himself for us. Jesus went to the cross to pay our debt for our sin, for our sickness, for our death once and for all. One man died so that we might live. And today, the offer is on the table for you. Will you and I choose today to put our faith, our hope, and our trust in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone? Will we allow Jesus to pay our debt? Will we allow him to do that for us today? And so as I close this message, I want you to consider right now, have you put your faith, your trust, your hope in Jesus Christ? And is that hope just a future hope of what might happen someday? Or do you believe that today Jesus Christ wants to be for you the resurrection and the life? That he wants to come into your circumstance, into your situation, and bring you today, in the moment you are watching this, hope and life and eternal life. If you today want to make the decision to put your faith in Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer along with me. You can also go right below us right now to the button that says live prayer. If you click on that button, one of our staff members, one of our pastors will join you and will pray with you no matter what your circumstance or situation is. Let's pray right now the simple prayer, the prayer that leads to eternal life. We say this, Jesus, today we believe that you are who you said you were. We believe that, Jesus, you are the Son of God, that you came into this world and died for my sin, and that you rose again from the dead. I put my faith in you today, Jesus. I ask you to save me. I ask you to forgive my sins, and I ask you for your eternal life in me today. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I want to encourage you in these difficult days to remember that the resurrection and the life of Jesus lives in you for today. And God is calling us as his church to bring his life and his power into the circumstances and situations that we are facing. So let's continue to pray for one another. Let's continue to meet with one another in whatever capacity and ways we can. If that has to be through the phone or online or through text, let's do it because we cannot give up the fellowship of the body of Christ because God wants to use us in this time, in this day, for his purpose in an amazing way. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we
the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song you are good good oh you are good good Jesus, we thank you. We say you are good. We love you. We worship you. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for being with us and worshiping together with us today. We hope that you enjoy your week. And would you go in peace and serve the Lord.